In the last class, we have discussed about the infrared gas analyzers and um, these are essentially infrared filter photometers. That means, no monochromator is required for the analysis of process gases. So, <laughs> I wanted you to remember that uh, the infrared radiation is split into two beams and then directed towards uh, bolometers wired in a balanced circuit. The sample gas flows through one cell and the reference gas flows through another cell and there is a separate detector for each sample gas as well as the um, reference gas and connected to two bolometers which are interconnected again with, uh, with by means of a diaphragm. This uh, figure I had shown you there is a sample cell and a reference cell, this is an interference cell and these two are bolometers separated by a, an electrical balancing unit and in the interference cell you can put any of the other process gases which may interfere in the analysis. So, if when the sample cell contains the analyte, the only the analyte will be absorbing the radiation and this diaphragm will be pushed downstairs and which is balanced electrically to give you a reading of the electrical signal which is again correlated to the concentration of the <coughs> analysis, concentration of the analyte gas. Now, this is one arrangement, another arrangement is like this that you have a simple same sample cell, there is no reference cell here, but you have an interference cell and again you have a filter cell and a compensating cell. So, as the radiation from the source is directed towards the sample cell, the uh, absorbance will take place and interference cell will absorb all the other radiations except the analyte. So, the radiation from the analyte is going to fall um, onto the bolometers and uh, the filter cell and compensating cell will work in tandem to give you the signal. So, the um, uh, interference of methane for example, can be eliminated by putting pure methane in the interference cell here and um, which filters out from both beams the wavelengths absorbed by methane. Thus, only ethylene is determined using this arrangement from 0 to 10 percent in a sample gas. So, such arrangements are useful for the determination of process gases and um, a number of uh, um, <coughs> number of process gases can be analyzed and the only arrangement you have to remember is that both d and d dash in the previous uh, signal in the previous arrangement here these d and d dash are uh, identical containing a sample of the gas being determined. Usually dilution is required and uh, this dilution is accomplished using argon and uh, <coughs> the uh, dilution is required to reduce the specific heat of the gas. The vessels are usually as usual separated by a diaphragm and one of them is pierced by a hole and the intact diaphragm is free to bend in response to the variation in the pressure and this causes a change in the electrical capacitance between D and D dash which will result in an electrical signal. So, you can uh, the difference in pressure depends again on the temperature which is in turn dependent upon the infrared radiation absorbed. The reference cell is filled with dry nitrogen and sealed off. You do not have to deal with that again once you buy the equipment and the two diaphragms constitute a capacitor which I had already told you which is incorporated in a high frequency electronic circuit which eventually energizes a small motor to drive a balancing vane across the reference beam till they match. 
So, the difference of this movement is, is uh, recorded as a signal that is a very simple arrangement and uh, detection limits of some of the gases determined by this technique I am uh, showing you here. For example, carbon monoxide is 1 percent, uh, 1 mole percent and carbon dioxide is 0 0.1, sulphur dioxide is 0 0.1, ammonia is 0 0.5 like that. Um, this is methane, next is um, ethane, butane, acetylene and C3H6 etcetera. So, the <laughs> chemical analysis of processed gases can be done like this using the non-dispersive infrared. The same instruments can also be used for uh, the determination of carbon dioxide that is non-dispersive infrared spectrometry, spectrometry even in ambient temperatures that is in the pollution control studies etcetera. One can determine the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air and carbon monoxide in the air, nitrogen oxides etcetera. They can also be determined using non-dispersive infrared spectrometry. Now, that is that apart we should uh, discuss how quantitative analysis is being performed using infrared spectrometry. As I told you earlier, the quantitative analysis is, uh, is uh, based on the Beer Lambert's law. That means, chemical and instrumental methods uh, effects may cause apparent deviations and also high values of absorbances. Since the energy is quite small, it is necessary to use rather wider slits, which introduces again errors in the molar absorptivities. Therefore, it is uh, the Beer Lambert's law or concentration relation with respect to IR absorption is a is uh, uh, only limited to empirical values rather than exact concentration determinations. Usually, a baseline method is employed for quantitative analysis. So, here I am showing you how an IR peak looks like this looks and here this is the percent transmittance versus wavelength and the concentration of the substance is known by weighing and suppose this is an IR peak, infrared peak and um, the total transmittance is this much P0 and uh, this is P, the difference is absorbed and you have to draw a baseline along the tangent and you can measure the peak area and uh, determine from the concentration. So, if you have different concentrations of the substances then it is possible to prepare a calibration curve corresponding to different concentrations and then plot peak area or absorbance whichever is convenient and you can determine the quantitatively the amount of the sample present in a given system. So, the slide also shows a complicated uh, infrared uh, uh, range here. In the first case, the tangent is very easy to draw. Here in the second case, in this region, you can see that there are number of peaks. One is here, another is here, and there is here like that. So, many tangents are possible, but all these things can be incorporated to obtain different kinds of absorbances. Uh, different kinds of uh, different uh, values of absorbances and then the concentration can be determined. Basically, a suitable IR band must be selected which is responsive to the functional group present in the sample. So, incident energy P naught is obtained by drawing a tangent to spectral absorption curve this is the tangent what we had uh, discussed earlier and uh, <coughs> the transmittance is measured at the point of maximum absorption. The value of log of P naught by P is plotted against concentration. Since the same cell is used for all determinations, 
many possible errors are automatically eliminated. Now, what do you do for solids? So, in solids, potassium bromide pellets of known weights are mixed with the various quantities of the analyte and uh, you can uh, take an internal standard of potassium thiocyanate or something like that uh, by about 0.2 percent by weight of the KBR and uh, the ratio of thiocyanate at 2125 centimeters that is the standard frequency uh, of the IR absorbance for thiocyanate 2125 centimeters inverse the ratio of the actual peak corresponding to thiocyanate uh, peak is uh, chosen and um, it is plotted against the concentration. <laughs> this is a typical infrared uh, spectrum in sp sp IR uh, instrument. Here um, it, it looks like a nice box, but you can see that the left side would be the um, source here and this is a sample compartment which opens up and this is the optics and the computer uh, controlled instrument. Such instruments are readily available in the market. So, I would uh, like to show you that uh, 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 typical infrared uh, um, analysis can be performed using the techniques what I have taught you so far. Now, I will stop here um, discussing about the infrared, but I will take you to another technique that is uh, <coughs> uh, mass spectrometry. Now, uh, this is uh, another technique that is uh, usual that is useful for the chemical analysis of substances mostly limited to organic, but inorganic mass spectrometry also can be uh, conducted as and when required. That means, the, the whole analysis is based on the mass uh, determination of the ions. So, uh, mass spectrometry is uh, basically a technique most accurate for the determination of the mass of a molecule and its elemental and uh, uh, elemental and isotopic compositions. Mass spectrometry is also extremely useful in the determination of the structure of the molecules and um, in mass spectrometry molecules are usually converted into ions which are separated by electric and magnetic field gradients on the basis of their mass to charge ratio and these mass to charge ratio are detected using the mass spectrometry. So, when a molecule is bombarded with a beam of energetic electrons, you take a molecule bombard it with a beam of energetic electrons under controlled conditions, it is converted largely into single positively charged molecular ion. That means, one electron is knocked off from the molecule and the mass does not change because uh, the mass of an electron is about 1, 1 by 1645 uh, times less than that of a proton. So, the loss of an electron does not result in any substantial change in the mass of the molecule and because it is an ion uh, owing to the loss of an electron we call it molecular ion, only one electron is lost from the whole molecule. That is one electron is knocked off from the molecule and the mass to charge ratio of this is simply the molecular mass of the ion. For example, take a look at this equation. We have um, this uh, compound tetramethyl butane, this is 1, 2, 3. Um, 2 2 dash dimethyl propane and if you knock off the molecular weight is 72 that is carbon uh, there are 1 2 3 4 5 carbon atoms 
that is 60 and 12 hydrogen atoms that is 6, 12. So, the total mass of the um, this molecule is 72. If we knock off one electron from here, what we get is a molecular ion that is with the same molecular weight, but carrying a positive charge. And this molecule may further undergo uh, decomposition to produce other mass ions. For example, the um, this is C 4 H 9 plus is possible with a 57 mass by E ratio. Then we have C 3 H 5 plus with 41, C 2 H 5 plus is 29, C 2 H 3 plus is 27 something like that. A number of other ions produced by the fragmentation of the molecular ion are produced and because their masses are also differing um, 57, 41, 29, 27 etcetera, they are also detectable along with the molecular mass that is uh, uh, 72 peak. So, the molecular ion breaks up into smaller units by a process known as fragmentation. The fragments which are positively charged are called as daughter ions and the molecular ion is known as the parent ion. So, a signal is obtained for each m by e ratio. The intensity of each signal depends again upon the relative concentration ab rather abundance of the each ion producing the signal. So, the peak whose intensity is maximum in the spectrum is arbitrarily assigned a value of 100 and all other peaks are calculated corresponding to this ion that is maximum abundant ion and uh, the 100 percent uh, peak is known as base peak. The intensities of other peaks are presented relative to this base peak. So, the base peak should not be confused with the molecular peak. Sometimes molecular peak may be um, most intense, but it is not the case all the time. So, one has to be a little careful when you are looking at the uh, mass spectrometry, mass spectrum of a compound because molecular ion is the one which is showing you the highest molecular uh, weight that is the parent ion. All others would be this thing, but the molecular ion need not be 100 percent base peak. So, the mass spectrum is essentially a graphic plot of the intensity versus m by e ratio. So, no two compounds can have exactly similar mass spectra that is understood because with each compound addition of an element uh, even inclu including hydrogen that is it will add a mass of one unit. So, the mass spectrum of a compound can be used as a fingerprint of a molecule. Any molecule if you want to know what is the uh, what is the compound first choice is go for a mass spectrum. So, find out what is the molecular weight and uh, that uh, molecular ion and molecular weight and then you can determine the different kinds of structures that are possible by knowing the elemental composition also. So, very small amounts of samples are required for the mass spectrometric analysis and uh, mixtures can be analyzed easily, but the, the spectrum m by mass spectrum would become complicated because mixtures means there are several other compounds in which you may be or may not be interested and uh, you have to discount the other molecular ions if the uh, if you know there are mixtures. It is also useful for unraveling the reaction mechanisms of the organic compounds and the identification of functional groups is quite possible in organic compounds. It is used for stable isotope tracer techniques in research. So, mass spectrometer is a very useful instrument in a good organic laboratory. So, the uh, essentially the mass spectrometer is uh, the what it does is 
uh, in a mass spectrometer a molecule m is bombarded with high energy electrons of the order of about 70 electron volts which corresponds to approximately 6688 uh, kilojoules per mole. This is the typical bond energy of the organic molecules that means in mass spectrometry you have to break the bonds then only you will get different ions molecular ions. So, when the energy of the bombarding electrons is equal to the ionization energy of the molecule one electron is knocked off from the molecule to produce the parent ion. So, you can see this reaction what I have put here is molecular molecule one electron knocked off ionization energy if you produce then what you get is m plus plus e minus. So, if you the energy of the bombarding electrons are much higher than the ionization energy of the molecule sometimes it may be equal sometimes it may be much higher also. Some bonds in the molecule will rupture all the time uh, and a new ion uh, and a fra another fragment is produced. So, new ion is further uh, fragmented you will get another new ion and further fragmentation. So, the minimum potential used for accelerating the bombarding electrons required to effect fragmentation is known as appearance potential uh, of the fragment ion. So, further increase in the potential may lead to more fragmentation and uh, more smaller ions are produced and uh, neutral fragments also may be produced. For the parent ion m by e equals the molecular weight because the mass of the electron is negligible. Now, the positively charged ions if I put them in a magnet or a um, electromagnet um, the charged ions travel towards the detector and give rise to sharp lines at their respective m by e values. The detector is basically an electrometer with electrical with electric and magnetic focusing device that means the through the magnet the uh, velocities of the mass ions will be changing and the one with the highest mass would be moving much more slowly than the one with the lowest mass. Here I am showing you a mass, typical mass spectrum, mass spectrum for neopentane what we had discussed earlier that uh, several species are uh, there and uh, here you would see that mass molecular mass uh, highest peak is 72, but the um, um, maximum intensity peak is corresponds to m by e ratio of 57. Then there are C 3 H 5 is 41, C 2 H 5 is 29 like that other peaks, uh, this, uh, other peaks are obtained. This is how a mass spectrometer mass spectrum of a compound looks like. So, from the patterns obtained from pure compounds and that given by the sample considerable information lot of information can be generated regarding the structure or composition of the sample. It is possible to obtain the spectra of the negative ions, but electrically neutral fragments if they are produced during the bombardment they cannot be detected in a mass spectrometer. So, we have to remember that. So, the basic unit of a mass spectrometer are a sample introduction system in which you introduce a small uh, amount of the sample as a jet of vapor or a liquid from the sample. Then you need an ion source to produce the ions from the mass sample molecules. Then you need a mass analyzer to separate the ions according to their m by e ratios and you need an ion collector and amplifier to act as a detector and um, probably because the um, ions are produced in large numbers and uh, large uh, quantities uh, uh, you need a recorder uh, automatic recorder that means, it cannot be done manually and a high vacuum system from ion source to the detector 
is an essential component of a mass spectrometer. So, this is the schematic diagram of uh, a mass spectrometer. Uh, here the sample injector is here, it is go, it goes into the ion source, we have a high vacuum mass analyzer and then ion detector, signal sensor and a recorder. This is a very simple schematic diagram. So, uh, let us discuss about the uh, different aspects of the mass spectrometer. So, uh, as far as sample introduction is concerned, we can say that it should be achieved by any one of the methods what I have I am showing you in this slide. One is the sample is converted into a spark electrode and kept in the ion source. A small amount of the sample can be coated on a filament and the fill you can heat the filament within the ion source or you can take 100 to 100 microgram to 1 nanogram of the sample you can directly introduce into the ion source and for this the sample must be sufficiently volatile otherwise you will not be able to handle if the substance is having very high uh, molecular weight and it cannot be volatilized easily etc. So, what about gases? The gases can be introduced from a glass bulb allowed uh, you can introduce them in a glass bulb and allowed to expand into a reservoir and the required quantity is allowed to flow into the ion chamber using a valve. So, you can control how much of the sample flows into the ion analyzer if you are introducing the gas directly. So, liquids can be introduced using micro pipettes or even simple syringes and the solids having melting points above 200 degree centigrade they should be introduced in the same way because the reservoir is kept heated. So, um, you can dissolve it and then put, uh, put the sample um, uh, solids, you can dissolve the solid in a liquid and introduce it as a liquid. So, high melting in inorganic materials can also be directly placed in a furnace called as Knudsen cell and uh, close to the ion source and the vapors may be allowed to pass into the ion chamber. These are the different ways in which we can introduce the sample. So, in the um, now when we come to the ion source, what I would like to say is the samples that are sufficiently volatile may be produced either by electron impact or by chemical ionization the electron you can bombard them with the electrons or simply keep on heating it until you get the ionized sample that is known as chemical ionization. The electron impact technique is basically a heated tungsten filament emitting electrons which are accelerated by applying a potential difference of about 70 volts. The kinetic energy of the electrons will be equal to 70 electron volts which is sufficient to analyze, ionize rather most of the organic molecules. So, you can uh, uh, the most probable reaction is like this that m plus e goes to m plus n 2 e, m plus will then undergo extensive fragmentation reactions. Often the molecular ion line will be missing in the spectrum that we should be aware. So, in the electron impact source, what we have is the heated filament is here and this is the anode and sample molecules are introduced somewhere here and the electrons will get bombarded, uh, electrons will bombard the molecules and then there is a repeller plate, sample molecules are here and then there is a slit system and through which it goes to the molecular ions will travel towards the ion analyzer. This is basically a very simple and schematic diagram um, for the production of the ions. In chemical ionization technique, a reagent gas is required that is you can use isobutane or methane or ammonia and you have to let it into the ion chamber 
at a pressure of about 10 raised to 2 uh, newtons per square meter and ionized by bombarding the electrons having kinetic energies up to 300 electron volts. The sample molecules are volatilized into fragmented reagent ions which can also protonate the sample molecules. So, for example, if you have a molecule like this and then you have a CH5 molecule at a ion, then it can pick up one uh, hydrogen from here producing MH and CH4. The observed M by E unit will be one unit more than the molecular weight. Such a possibility one has to be aware and um, the, this is the schematic diagram of a CI chemical ionization source. Here the reagent gas is introduced like this and this is the ion chamber and this is the direct insertion probe through which the sample is this thing and then uh, introduced and uh, this is the GC reentrant and this goes to the pump and we have a slit and analyzer focusing apparatus and all other things will be in place. So, the internal energies of the MH ions increases in the order of increasing molecular weight. For example, this is CH5 ion is higher than C4H9 and which is much higher than NH4 ion. This means when CH5 plus transfers an proton to a molecule M to form MH plus, much energy is liberated because M has greater affinity for H plus than methane because methane cannot pick up another uh, hydrogen atom. So, the liberated energy can cause fragmentation of the MH plus itself. And NH4 plus has the least internal energy in the above list that is in this list. So, this is because ammonia has great affinity for H plus. It just picks up another hydrogen atom to form NH4 plus. So, if at all if it transfers H plus there will be little excess energy to cause further fragmentation of the sample molecules. Therefore, ammonia is the least preferred one compared to butane. So, the ammonia chemical ionization is basically an excellent method for the determination of the molecular weights of unknown molecules. Negative ion spectra can be produced by chemical ionization uh, method and chemical ionization can be used for non-volatile substances also. So, for non-volatile substances, ionization methods basically include uh, field desorption that is uh, this is um, field desorption you can use or uh, fast atom bombardment known as FAB or californium, californium plasma desorption that is known as CFPD or you can use laser des uh, desorption and photonizer. Different techniques are there to produce ions. In the field desorption method, a solution of the sample is simply smeared on a heated wire maintained around 8000 volts. So, the electrons are transferred from the sample to the wire metal and positive ions are desorbed by the electrostatic repulsion. So, the ions may collide to form MH plus. So, once MH plus is produced, then we have the way clear for the production of other uh, molecular ions. So, in laser desorption, the uh, sample is irradiated with a laser beam and uh, here the energy gets absorbed by the sample, it volatilizes and ionizes it. So, it is um, um, not possible to go more into details because uh, basically these are all uh, specialized instruments and um, each instrument will have its own separate uh, um, way of um, separate way of producing the mass ion. 
So, the another technique that we had discussed is fast ion bombardment. Here the sample is dissolved in a solvent like a glycerol homologue and bombarded with a beam of xenon atoms. The fast xenon atoms are produced by accelerating the xenon ions to about 6.9 electron volt kilo electron volts and then neutralizing these with the electronic tra electron transfer. You can take a look at this slide. Um, what I am shown you here is xenon ions can combine with another xenon to produce xenon ions and xenon molecule. So, the only the momentum is transferred here basically and the sample is desorbed as an ion by the momentum transfer rather than the um, production of separate ions. Now, we have also discussed the californium um, atom bombardment that is we use 252 californium plasma desorption and um, in this 252 californium undergoes spontaneous fission giving rise to 142 barium 18 plus that 79 uh, MeV and another uh, atom that is produced is 106 TC 22. This 106 uh, refers to the atomic weight and um, this happens at 104 MeV. These fast ions what they do is they pass through the sample both M plus and M minus are produced because that means they ionize the whole sample. In a, um, this is another way of producing the atoms. So, in a spark source electrodes are made out of the sample and a spark is generated to produce the ions. In a spark source electrodes are made out of the sample that means just like what we had discussed earlier ICP inductive coupled plasma you take two electrodes in which the samples are put and brought together under high voltage. A similar technique is employed here and um, a spark is generated to produce the ions. In the spark source the electrodes themselves must be made of the sample and uh, or you can put the sample in a cavity in an electrode and bring the um, sparks nearer and at some stage you will get a spark and high energy is generated and um, the ions will be produced. So, another technique is photo ionization. Here the source in this uh, photo ionization source the sample is irradiated by intense light to produce the ions. So, all in all there are different ways of producing the um, producing the molecular ions and fragment ions depending upon the type of work what you usually do. And uh, if you are uh, using a mass spectrometer in which uh, radioactive substances are involved then it is better to go for 252 californium like that one can use different kinds of uh, mass spectrometers um, ion producers mechanisms. And uh, the ions from the mass analyzer ion source are usually repelled by electron repeller electrodes and um, which are if they are repelled by with the same force in by which they are generated then they get accelerated and get injected into the mass analyzer. Here the ions are separated according to their m by e ratio as we have discussed earlier and uh, this principle is illustrated by Dempster's mass spectrometer. Very simple mass spectrometers have been constructed right from about 1850s and uh, nowadays the uh, instrumentation in mass spectrometer has reached a very high level and in uh, Dempster's mass spectrometer positively charged ions entering from the ion source are accelerated by an electrostatic field. So, a magnetic field H is applied in a perpendicular direction. So, the ions do get accelerated and um, um, this is uh, the next slide shows you that uh, a Dempster's mass spectrometer. Here we have a source slit 
that means we assume that all the ion production is over and from the ion chamber, chamber the ions are entering a magnet and here there is a collector plate the this, uh, diameter of this is 2 r and the electrons will travel through the magnet and fall onto the collector plate. So, the ones which are um, having exact um, path will get through to through the detector, but others are not. So, at as you increase the collector plate voltage, you will be able to collect this one, this one, this one at separate um, uh, electrode uh, electronic values separate voltages. So, under the influence of the magnetic field, the ions travel in a circular path and fall on a collector after traveling 180 degrees. So, the kinetic energy of the ion of charge E accelerated by a voltage is equal to V volts electron volts. So, that is 1 by 2 m V square is equal to E into V that is the equation what we use in this slide. So, we want to make sure that the um, voltage 1 by 2 m V square this is the momentum this is the electronic voltage and where V is the velocity of the uh, this small v and um, uh, this is the voltage sorry and um, v is the velocity of the ions m is the mass and e is the charge and v is the potential. So, at a time one molecular ion will be produced and that will be reaching the electrode collector plate. In a magnetic field the ions experience a force H E V such that it travels in a circular path of the radius r and uh, by Newton's second law you can um, write force is equal to mass into acceleration and acceleration sh is, uh, should be f by m. So, a is also equal to v square by r. So, we, um, we compare these two uh, equations that is v square by r should be equal to h into E v by m and uh, the, this will uh, if you work out a little bit. So, um, here we take the squares and then 1 by 2 m v square if we generate you will see that m by v value corresponds to h square r square divided by 2 v and um, this gives us a maximum an expression for collecting the mass of a particular ion. So, if V is kept constant and magnetic field is varied, ions with different m by E will reach the collector at uh, different values and uh, different values of the magnetic field. So, if H is con kept constant, you can uh, you have two choices. One is you can increase the magnetic uh, keep the v velocity constant and increase the magnetic field from uh, 0 to 70 or you can keep the h magnetic field constant and increase change the velocities the process is called voltage scanning so you can change the by changing the voltage you can change the velocities this is essentially the crux of mass spectrometry so, what uh, I would like to uh, tell you at this stage is due to variations in the kinetic energy of the ions entering the mass spectrometer that is the magnetic field etcetera from the ion source the resolution of the Dempster's mass spectrometer is limited because the um, kinetic energy is not uniform all the time. To overcome this problem the ions are passed through an electric field prior to the magnetic field. So, what does the what does it mean we pass the uh, ions through an electric field first prior to magnetic field and the um, here 
the ions are focused and then pass through a slit into the magnetic sector. So, that means focusing is already done. This results in higher resolution that can distinguish m by e differences of the order of 0 0.01 mass unit. That is good because it will give you a way of reproducing the mass spectrum within the this thing. So, here is again I have put uh, the modified arrangement. One is the ion source, I have an electrostatic analyzer, this is the slit and then after the, the electrical electrostatic analyzer, we pass it through the magnetic analyzer that is M A and then on to the collector slit. So, this way we can differentiate between 0 0.01 mass unit very comfortably. Now, once you are able to collect the uh, separated mass of the mass ion from a given compound and a sample, the ions separated by the mass analyzer must be measured how? It must be measured by the current generated when the ions fall onto the detector. So, this order is approximately 10 micro amperes to 1 milliamps they produce. The ions pass through the collecting units and fall on to the collector electrode. So, the latter that is the collecting electrode is shielded thoroughly from the stray ions that is very important. Stray ions should not be coming and hitting the uh, detect collector plate at the same time. So, that will not uh, lead to a good mass spectrum. So, the recorder records peaks of all sizes and the scanned spectrum is obtained. So, it is more essential that stray ions should not be collected. They should, there must be a mechanism to remove all the stray ions before it hits the collector electrode. So, it is possible to replace the collector electrode with a photographic uh, plate and develop it and then measure the darkening at different positions which is proportional to the intensity of the corresponding ion. This is another way of detecting and determining the mass spectrum. So, the let us discuss a little about the time of flight mass spectrometers. So, in a time of flight mass spectrometer, all the ions emerge simultaneously from the electrostatic field with the same energy. So, the ions with the largest mass will have the lowest velocity. So, they can they take the they take longer time to reach the detector collector plate that means to travel the same distance the molecular ions with the maximum um, with the maximum molecular weight will take longer the lighter ones will travel faster. Essentially this is the principle of the time of the flight mass spectrometer. So, uh, schematic diagram of the time of mass spectrometer I am showing you here. It is very simple schematic diagram. This is the ion plate and then slates. One is electrostatic this thing and then uh, the collector plate and the detector. Very simple. So, <laughs> um, actually when I say it is very simple, it means that uh, the principle is simple, but not the instrumentation. Instrumentation is much more complicated involving the management of the bombardment source and then collector electrode voltages etcetera. The chemistry part is only related to required is the uh, sample introduction and then interpretation. The all other things are basically instrumentation controlled and most of these things are nowadays microprocessor controlled. So, a voltage pulse on grid extra on a grid A extracts the ions from the source. Here we need a voltage pulse to extract the ions. The ions are accelerated by the potential difference between the two 
and pass into a free flight tube round tube where there is no field action on the ions. The ions are separated in time as they travel depending upon their um, m by e ratios and collected at d that is the collector plane. So, the time difference between the successive peaks should be minimum 0.1 microseconds. So, you can write an equation like this t is proportional to square root of m by e that is uh, the equation will always uh, um, can be very simply written like this that is t is proportional to square root of m by e and uh, t is also equal to uh, you can put a constant and square root of m by e and um, the where k is a constant which depends on the length of the free flight. So, this is a very simple equation and uh, then we can discuss a little about quadrupole mass spectrometers. So, a quadrupole mass spectrometer has four, electro, four electrode systems are used in which the opposite electrodes are connected together. So, a constant voltage u and a radio frequency potential is required and voltage is applied between the opposite pairs of four parallel rods. Ions are injected along the x direction and the spectrum is scanned by varying the um, voltage keeping the u by v ratio constant. So, these are relatively cheaper instruments compared to time of flight uh, instruments. So, this is essentially about the instrumentation, but uh, what I would like to tell you again in the at this time is that the um, mass spectrometry and infrared spectrometry are basically user oriented instruments and um, the more uh, you work on these instruments, the more expertise you will gain and no amount of teaching will make you an expert on the interpretation part. So, the interpretation of mass spectrum is a separate subject by itself and one can take a um, uh, take uh, umbrage in the fact that as you keep on using a mass spectrometer your expertise will improve. So, extensive libraries of mass spectrum are available nowadays that is databases and it is possible to make all the necessary conclusions by matching the spectrum of an unknown compound with the correct spectrum available in the library and with the help of a computer the whole job becomes simpler. Otherwise, interpretation of a mass spectrum depends on the thorough knowledge of the empirical facts relevant to the case. In other words, interpretation of mass spectrum is always a specialist job depending upon the type of compounds what you are handling. So, uh, I would not dwell more on this uh, aspect because um, uh, the more I teach the more we will get into the chemistry of the subject and it may it is not relevant for this present course. So, for the at this stage what I would like to say is the instrumentation of uh, mass spectrometry is essentially a very simple uh, system, but more involved with respect to the preparation of the magnet, ion bombardment source and detector plates etcetera. But the interpretation the, the instrumentation remains a remains the domain of the electrical engineers and uh, mechanical engineers and uh, maintenance engineers. The use and application of mass spectra are always in the chemist's domain. So, the more you would like to know the more uh, you have to use the instrument more and then you will be able to get the required expertise for the uh, for brevity for the sake of brevity uh, I have included this mass spectrum 
for this uh, course just to give you an insight into how a mass spectrometer works and what are the typical uses of a mass spectrometer and um, how we can uh, it will give you an insight when you should use a mass spectrometer. Basically, what you should be doing is if you are handling typically organic compounds, then you can use mass spectrometer for the um, for the um, for following a chemical reaction and the mass spectral data can be used to interpret the reaction mechanisms or uh, the um, the generation of the different ions from the molecule that can be used that it can be used and sometimes mass spectrometers are also coupled with gas chromatographs or uh, uh, high pressure liquid chromatographs so that the uh, the separated compounds from gas chromatography or HPLC can be directly automatically injected into a mass spectrometer to get the typical separations as well as identification of the substances. So, I will stop here and in the next class what we will do is we will take a similar look on the instrumentation of uh, uh, NMR technique which is another technique very similar to this, but the uh, interpretation and uh, the um, usage are more limited to organic chemists rather than analytical scientists. But as for the sake of brevity, we will continue our discussion on this uh, NMR in the next class.